So we thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our study together today in chapters 8 and 9 of the book of 2 Corinthians. Very quickly to give an overview, we have a little bit of a challenge today because we're trying to deal with two chapters, whereas in all of the previous lessons in this uh, series, we pretty much limited ourselves to one chapter. Uh, we dealt with introductory matters. Perhaps last week, in one sense, we dealt with chapter 6 and 7, but in another sense, we really focused on chapter 6 since we'd previously spoken about chapter 7. So if we come to chapters 8 and 9, and we think about how to outline those two chapters, uh, we could do it pretty simply, which is the slide I have in front of us right now. Um, Paul spends some time writing to the Corinthians about details of the collection for the poor in Jerusalem. Gentile churches were helping uh, with the needs of Jewish Christians, especially in the area of Jerusalem. So about the first half of the chapter, we could say in a, a rounding it off, about the first half of the chapter deals with some details of the collection. We'll come back and study that. The second half deals with instructions that are specific to the return of Titus and his companions to Corinth and some changes in Paul's instructions, anticipating Titus's return to Corinth. Actually, the, that paragraph, the last part of chapter 8, continues in chapter 9 in the first five verses, uh, about the collection for the poor and details of Titus's return and the possibility of some of the Macedonians going with him. It's a continuation of the same paragraph. It's one of those cases in the New Testament where the chapter division is not particularly helpful so that uh, we really only have three major paragraphs that we're uh, studying together today. And then the last paragraph deals with chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. So with Without saying anything further uh, about the content of those paragraphs, I'd like to do some uh, things that are introductory in the midst of uh, what we're sharing together. First of all, simply to observe again that chapters 8 and 9 are a single literary unit that focuses on the activity of the Gentile churches helping with the poor. The theme is a specific collection for the poor in Jerusalem, in the area around Jerusalem, and Paul and those traveling with him are going to be responsible for delivering that collection or that offering to those churches. Now, to give some historical background about that particular contribution, we see first in Acts 11, verses 27 through 30, that the church in Antioch had sent funds to Jerusalem during a famine. So we have a precedent, and then we could read also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 6, verse 10, that Paul had been encouraged to adopt a similar emphasis in his mission work. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, we have the specific instructions that are the basis or the background for 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. We don't have time to go back through all of those details, but I do want to, just to give us orientation, mention that there were six aspects of the instructions that Paul gave to the church at Corinth, or the directive that he gave to the church at Corinth, these all reflect the instructions he had given to the Galatian church. So if we were to analyze 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, what we would see is, number one, the instructions relate specifically to the collection for the poor. Number two, there was to be the participation of every, Christ, of every Christian. So Paul writes, each one of you. That was to be happening every first day of the week, every Sunday. Number four, they were saving up the funds individually or privately at or in oneself. And so there's a difference in translation there for perhaps, but the point is that they were doing this individually or privately. Number five, let each one of you set aside. So there was some process of setting aside that was done again individually. And number six, they were reserve, reserving or storing up. The instructions specifically say what you've prospered. And so there's a certain extent to which whatever's left over, maybe that could be a part of it, whatever's left over after you've met your basic needs, uh, you're supposed to be laying all of that aside. And so those particular instructions, as we will see, uh, did not function very well in Corinth. And so Paul in the text today is going to make an adjustment. In Romans chapter 15, verse 26, 
the contributions of both Macedonia and Achaia, that would be Corinth, uh, are mentioned. So the question that we have uh, that we may get to, but if we don't get to it, I want to at least mention it here, is how do we apply these particular passages today? What kinds of things uh, should we specifically try to duplicate in the churches? Are we to see only principles, since this was a specific we call it occasional literature written to specific people at a specific time in a specific situation for a specific purpose. So it was a specific occasion. So here we cannot duplicate the specifics. We're not taking up a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. So should we be seeing principles? Uh, what are those principles and how do we apply them? Uh, are there secondary applications? because we could see principles that would apply beyond the generosity of the offering. And so all of those kinds of things uh, we may want to think about as we think about how to apply the text. Now let's come to chapter 8 in a little bit more detail. I, the first thing, thing it seems to me is always the question, what does the Bible say? We, we really can't understand what it is saying today until we know what it said in the original context. So the first thing I want to do, in fact, mostly what I want to do in the video today, the video portion of our class, is I want to overview what the text was saying because that's our first step toward understanding what it is saying today. I, a principle for me of Bible study is it's not going to be saying something today that it wasn't saying back then. And so we want to ask ourselves the question, what is the Bible saying in the context in which it was written? What was it saying to the original recipients of the letter? And then we can talk about, well, how do we apply those things in our lives today? So again, what we see in chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, is that the Gentile churches were involved in a collection that was designed to meet the needs of Jewish Christians in the area of Jerusalem. These are distant locations. And so the people that are participating in the contribution had not had an opportunity to meet the people they were helping. And they had only heard about them. Perhaps significant is the fact that the churches that are helping are Gentile churches and they're meeting the needs of the Jewish Christians. Now the first thing that we come to in chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 is the fact that the Macedonian churches have participated. But the Corinthian churches who had begun earlier with their commitment have not finished the commitment that they had made. So the Macedonian churches in the example that Paul cites are giving willingly and voluntarily of their own accord because they first gave themselves to the Lord. Their generosity is the result of their commitment to the Lord, their commitment to the will of God, to their fellow workers. And so Paul uses that example to say to the Corinthians in verses uh, 6 and 7 that they should complete the, their collection, that they should do what they said that they would do. And Titus had taken that message to them. Titus had shared the same message. And in verse 7, Paul encourages them also to participate in the collection, and he mentions another principle, the concept of abundance, that which has been abounding and overflowing from God so that they would participate in sharing the grace that God had given them. If we come to chapter 8, verses 8 through 11, just overviewing quickly the content of these chapters, these verses, it seems to me, deserve more careful attention than we have often given them. Because Paul clearly says, I'm reading from the NIV, but beginning in chapter 8 and verse 8, Paul clearly says, now what I'm writing to you, I am not commanding you. Uh, I am not commanding you, but I want you to be able to prove the sincerity of your love in comparison to the earnestness of others. So Paul is revising his instructions, or we might say he is giving now some advice to the Corinthians about giving. He had previously given them a command, writing that they should follow the model that he had shared in Galatia. Now he does not give a command. Kind of interesting because it's been observed more than once that commands don't work very well in the matter of Christian giving. What matters are our motives, and Paul, Paul's advice in these verses represents a change from his instructions. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. I think we have to note that what Paul writes is a change. He says, don't do it like I told you to do it before. I always think this is intriguing because so often when I do mission work and travel in Latin America, one of the favorite texts that the brothers like to read before they partake of the uh, uh, collection or before they give the offering is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. And I always kind of cringe and I want to say, wait a minute, Paul said those instructions didn't work, at least not in Corinth. Now, they may have worked well in Galatia. So the previous command, at least for the churches in Corinth, the church in Corinth, had not worked. They had not followed the instruction. And so Paul gives them uh, a different way of fulfilling their commitment. Paul uh, says again in verse 10, this is my advice. Uh, about what is best for you in this matter. You began last year, you were among the first, uh, not only to give, but the first to begin to give, the first to want to give. And now, how are we going to complete the offering that you planned to give? That's kind of the, the question of chapter 8, verses 8 through 11. So Paul urges them to finish their participation in the collection by using a different method. And he in verses 8, 8, 12 through 15, clarifies various aspects of that advice. Now, the first step, Paul assumes, is still in place, and that is that they were willing and ready. The second thing is that he sets up the fact that their giving is to be according to what they have and not according to what they do not have. So he somewhat changes this idea of each one of you and says, well, now we're asking you to give from what you have. And if you do not have, then we're not asking you to give from what you don't have. Uh, that may seem a strange way to say that. Uh, he continues to say that there may have been a difficulty because they were saving up individually or privately. There are several ways that you can look at verses 12 through 15 and see some of the contrasts. Above all, he says that we're not trying to make it hard on you so that they, in the, the Christians in Jerusalem, will have it good. Uh, we're looking at the principle of equality, so there should be a proportional giving. That particular aspect of Paul's revised advice has been used by many modern religious groups, of course, within the general realm of Christendom, uh, to try to present the idea of a tithe that it should be proportional. But obviously, Paul is not suggesting uh, that there should be some kind of a corporate model. It's still very much an individual model. The second part of the chapter uh, has to do with Titus and his companions going ahead to Corinth. It's a rather interesting section of text to me, partially because of the way Paul writes it. He writes from the perspective of the Corinthians once they have received the letter. So the tenses are kind of strange, but most of our translations uh, deal with that without any kind of difficulty. So Paul is telling them why the funds will be administered in a, in a very trustworthy way. He mentions Titus. He mentions the two brothers who are going to be traveling with him. And that particular paragraph continues on in to chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. He's still talking in chapter 9 about the collection for the poor in Jerusalem. So I want to move straight on to that and say that we have motivation and more advice concerning the collection. This is a continuation of Paul's change of instruction, if you will, or his new advice, I'm not commanding you. He says, I really don't need to write to you about the need to complete the contribution. I believe you want to do that. I, I believe that you are yet eager and ready to do that. Um, I've been telling the Macedonians all about your eagerness. It looks like Paul was telling the Macedonians about the eagerness of the Corinthians, and now he's writing to the Corinthians about the eagerness of the Macedonians. Almost, kind of interesting, almost setting up a competitive relationship in all of this, uh, encouraging both of them to participate in this collection and to do so enthusiastically. Um, now, he also is writing to Corinth uh, to give them more instructions or, or more uh, awareness, giving them an orientation about why it's important to him that they complete 
uh, the commitment that they had made. And that is because as Titus travels and then as Paul travels, Paul is thinking that some of the Macedonians might want to come with him. So he's 9-3, I'm sending the brothers, that's Titus and the two brothers, I'm sending the brothers in order that uh, our boasting will not be empty or hollow, that you will be ready. Because if the Macedonians come with me and they find that you're not prepared and that you're not doing what I said you were doing and you've not completed the commitment that you made, then I would be embarrassed as well. Uh, so Paul is writing because he's interested in the well-being of the Corinthians in this, in this matter. So uh, perhaps that's two paragraphs beginning in chapter 8. Maybe it's only one paragraph that goes all through chapter 8 and into chapter 9, verse 5. However we organize it, it, it should be understood as a unit. I think when we come to chapter 9 and verse uh, 6, uh, then we can see uh, a little bit of, uh, of a change. Um, we come to a, a second part of this, and Paul motivates them or puts a cap on all of this teaching. And this is a place where in the application we may want to think about uh, the fact that there are many other applications beyond uh, the giving that is a part of our life, the generosity that is a part of our life, Paul gives them instructions that will guide them toward generous giving. And one of the first things is that God loves a cheerful giver. And so it's not a compulsory matter. It's not according to what you don't have. It's according to what you do have. Uh, it's to be a generous gift. It's not to be a grudging gift, chapter 9, verse 5. It's to be generous because the one who sows sparingly reaps sparingly, and the one who sows generously reaps generously. A number of Old Testament passages that are a part of this uh, teaching of Paul as well, each one according to what they decided, uh, each one not reluctantly. God loves cheerful giving. And generosity, moving to a second part of chapter 9, verses 8 through 10, generosity shows that we are dependent upon God. Even again, as the Old Testament citation shows, uh, when we scatter abroad, uh, we imitate God. God has given generous gifts to the poor. Uh, God has given his righteousness, enduring forever, and he has abundantly spread forth that generosity, that righteousness to all. And even if we see that our giving is somewhat like sowing seed, God gives generously so that we have enough seed to sow. If we compare giving to the idea of sowing seed, and we're sowing seed, and we're not going to run out of seed. That's, in essence, what Paul is saying here. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and increase your store. Uh, and, of course, the reason you keep sowing more and more is so that you will have a greater harvest. And so that's another principle that, sets, that is set forth in this passage. It's kind of interesting to read the passage, beginning in verse uh, 5, with an emphasis on the word all or every, um, because th this word just comes through this again and again. I'm actually going to go back to uh, verse 7 and begin with each man or every man, all of you, beginning in verse 7, each one should give what he's decided. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you in all things at all times with all you need. You will abound in every good work. And then moving down to verse 11, you will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. So there's very much a focus here on the completeness of what God does for us and the personal benefits that come from generous giving. So verse 12, the service that you perform will not only supply the needs of God's people, but many people will give thanks. That's what it says in verse 12, many expressions of thanks to God. Now that idea is expanded in verses 13 through 15. Others are thankful. Others glorify God because of the example, because they receive as a result of our generosity. I certainly see that again and again as we share with saints, Christians, brothers and sisters in Latin America especially who have so much less, they are so thankful. They are so often praising God. And they themselves, out of their own 
poverty, out of their own lack of resources, at least as, as we look at it from a U.S. vantage point. I received a couple of weeks ago a letter from dear friends, brother and sister in Guatemala. We've spent time with them, stayed in their home, just wonderful, wonderful people, uh, somewhat younger than Jan and I, and she has been diagnosed with cancer, and so they were needing to raise money for a treatment of radiation and, and, and chemo in Guatemala City. It was $2,700, and I, he said, we're, we're working on it. We need to find this so that we can have the treatment. And I said, well, let me know if there's something that we can do to help. Well, he wrote me uh, about a week ago, last weekend, and said, we're going to go Monday. Please pray for us. We're going to go Monday. I haven't had a word except they did go Monday. Uh, I haven't had any word about results. Of course, you don't know results immediately on chemotherapy and radiation. But what amazed me was that they raised that money from the churches, from the brothers and sisters, from the Christians in Guatemala. And they were so grateful because the principle is true. When we give generously, when we are blessed by the generous giving of other people, Others are thankful, and God is glorified. And so verse 14 says, In their prayers for you, their hearts go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Such and such a blessing to be able to share generously because generosity is contagious. When we are generous, others want to be generous. When we are blessed by the generosity of others, then we praise God. We're thankful. We glorify God. We have to learn two things. We have to learn to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive the words of Acts chapter 20. We also, at times, have to learn how to receive. I remember an elder in Michigan telling me, he said, Brother Bob, you know that passage that says it's more blessed to give than to receive? He said, when, when you don't want to receive from us, he said, you're taking away from us the blessing of giving. And I learned that when people want to bless us, we accept the blessing. But we also pass it on so that others are thankful and glorify God. So there in a very quick way is an overview of what we might see in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and 9 a couple of very interesting principles that I've tried to set forth. Uh, one that uh, seems to me to be very, very important uh, is the idea that Paul is altering. Uh, he is improving in some way, giving advice, no longer a command, but that Paul is, is wanting them to realize that there is a better way for them to fulfill the commitment that they've made. Uh, looking back at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, just a number of very, very helpful principles that we can apply not only with the giving of our financial resources, but also as we share our lives together. As we pray for one another, as uh, we serve one another, as we seek ways that we can be a blessing in the lives of others, and as we ourselves are always aware that we depend upon God and that we evidence that by being generous, even to the point that we may not know how God is going to continue to meet needs, but we are doing what God has put us here to do, blessing others. It's rather interesting. I want to, to close our study, at least this part of our study, with an observation, uh, a statement that I heard from a preacher, uh, not original with me, but I've always remembered it. It stuck with me. And that is this, there is nothing that makes us more like God. We are never more like God than when we give. And so this idea that we give, uh, that we can be like God, and in that giving, that we imitate him, that we bless others, is to me a great thought and a wonderful way for us to stop the video part of our class today. Thank you for being with us on the video. May God bless you. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to being with you in the next study uh, of chapters 10 and 11 as we come nearer and nearer to finishing our online study of the book of 2 Corinthians. Have a great week.